Onun dışında başladık. Yayına başladın mı? Yayına başladın mı? Bana haber ver ki. Şimdi başladım hocam. Herkese hoş geldiniz diyorum. Ben Cengiz Han Öztürk. Boğaziçi Üniversitesi Biyomedikal Mühendisliği ile Yaşam Bilimleri ve Teknolojileri Uygulama Araştırma Merkezimizin ve İstanbul Sağlık Endüstrisi Kümelenmesi'nin birlikte organize ettiği, tanıttığı, duyurduğu akademisyenleri, sanayiden insanları, öğrencileri, herkesi bir araya getiren seminer serimize hoş geldiniz. Salı günleri saat 13'te devam ediyoruz. Bu sene de çok değerli bu dönem bu, bu hafta da çok değerli bir konumuz var. İlginç konuşmasıyla bizlere olacak yerde anlatacak Urartu Şeker. E, Unam'dan bu seminer İngilizce olacak. Onun için İngilizceye dönüyorum. The seminar will be in English. Thank you for all coming. This is a combined seminar organized by Institute of Biomedical Engineering at Boğaziçi University by Center for Life Sciences and Technologies and also Istanbul Health Industry Cluster. Today we have a distinguished guest, very exciting topic. It's a pleasure to have him here, Dr. Orarti Shekhar. Uh, co he completed his PhD in molecular biology, genetics, and biotechnology from Istanbul Technical University in 2009, then continued uh, on, um, as a postdoctoral researcher first at Singapore Nanyang Technical Technological University on uh, biophotonics, later at MIT Synthetic Biology Center, where he combined all of these technologies for new and exciting fields in nanobiotechnology. He joined UMRAM in 2014 and uh, doing many exciting things uh, with overall team of, on synthetic biology. So looking forward to his talk, the floor is yours. Professor Sheker, please take it from here. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Jing uh, Zanajan. Uh, thank you very much for both for your invitation and for your kind introduction. So uh, today I'll talk about uh, the synthetic biosystems, synthetic biology, uh, and uh, I will try to give some overview using some examples from our own laboratory. And uh, we, I will try to mention some of the work which has been uh, published and which has been around for a while. Uh, so of course we are also running some, a lot of new and exciting uh, research, uh, but uh, I think that it will be, in, uh, for now, it will be uh, really uh, easier to deliver a talk on the topics uh, which are already, uh, uh, which are already uh, fin finalized. So uh, please, uh, uh, if you have any questions in the meantime, just stop me and ask a question. I don't know the, what, what's the what's the rule here is, but yeah, just I, I would love to answer your question. So, um, so let's start with this. Um, what's synthetic biology? Um, be, uh, before I used to have a, a slide talking about what synthetic biology, some definitions of synthetic biology. But later on, I decided not to use that slide because uh, I think that it's, it's, it's, it's, there's a better way to uh, make people to understand what synthetic biology and what, what we are trying to. Uh, achieve here uh, using some uh, actual examples. So uh, that's why I'm using these two figures. The, both of, uh, I got the, the one from uh, on the left hand side from a Nature Biotech paper, it's a review paper and there's the other paper is published back in, uh, in science back in 1995. So uh, the first one is basic, basic, basically shows uh, that what, uh, what, how do we see a simple bacterium? A simple bacterium is actually a well-defined uh, uh, machine. So it, we call it a bio, uh, biological device. Why we call it biological device? Because it has, uh, it uses a lot of different type of tools. Uh, and it is, it has a, it, it, it basically carries out a function and it uses some input uh, signals that those are being collected uh, from the environment, from its environment. And then the, those are also processed. So uh, as you see here, so there, a simple bacterium has a lot of environmental sensors. So that it allow, and this, this, this, this, all this data is uh, that uh, coming from the environment is basically like it can be a small molecule, it can be a peptide, a protein. Those are all interacting with some specific 
receptors on the surface. And this is, this is not happening through some random interaction, but a specific binding. So, and this specific binding basically turns on some sensors and the, there's this, uh, on, at the downstream of the sensors, uh, this, the sensors are directly wired with some other machineries for protein secretion or some other uh, small molecule uh, synthesis, et cetera. So, and these are allowed them to deliver some proteins, express, uh, make uh, or produce some small molecules. Then all this, uh, all this information is basically processed uh, using some logic gates. And the logic gates are basically, uh, it, it, it, it, this is basically a bacteria, uh, uh, this is basically a way to say that a bacterium can do calculation. Uh, right after this calculation, it, pro it produces some information that, that information is be being used either the cell will decide to move or stay, for example, okay? So uh, if, uh, if, if, this, if, uh, if there's, an, there's an increased number of to toxic molecules, so this cell uh, decides to run. So uh, what, uh, and for that purpose, it has, uh, it, it uses some special machinery, that's a flagellum, and uh, the, that allows uh, the bacterium to move from one point to another one. And it is also genetically controlled. So, and you can basically, make some changes you can also control this this this uh this motion of this bacteria just controlling some genetic, uh, some some gene expression here so uh, this when you look at uh, from this perspective this is just a simple and a, a great machine that has evolved uh for uh, billions of years so and uh today uh this is uh, this is basically a uh, basically a, a short uh summary uh, showing that how this, this uh, basic uh, information can be processed using some tools of uh, some, some molecular tools. Similarly, uh, when, we, uh, the, when we are trying to understand, I mean, this, is, this is a good example to understand what's going on inside, but then we have this question in mind, how we can engineer this system? So, okay, we have a, uh, we have a great machinery here. Uh, it can, we can use them as micro, micro robots and we can use them to deliver drugs, we can use them to send some molecules, we can use for many other applications. We can use them for therapeutic, therapeutic purposes. So, but the question is, how, uh, there isn't any bacterium available in nature that, is, that suits uh, for most of our needs. The reason is nature doesn't need, uh, nature's needs and our needs are totally different. That's why we need to evolve our own uh, living uh, systems. So how we can do uh, this uh, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is another big question. So um, one of the things that uh, to uh, come up with a simple idea is, um, let's look what we have in our hands. So uh, electrical engineers uh, and electronic engineers and physicists, so uh, working on developing a lot of different theories uh, in, uh, <coughs> in making uh, electrical circuits for a long time. So now, at the, at our uh, in today's world, in today's technology, we know that we have we uh, this this uh, we can make this really large integrated circuit, and we can control many signals. We can we can process many signals. We can use the signals to create some functions, etc. So the, uh, and these two engineers come up with the idea: Why don't we use this approach, okay, to understand what's going on within within a cell? So then we can, because we already know how to make circuits on, on, on, on a motherboard of, of your computer, we can also, we may also find some ways to use genetic tools to build up such genetic circuits. So this is an example they use. This is a, this is a phage, this is a, it's, it's a lambda phage, and it is specifically uh, infects a bacterium, E. coli actually. So when it enters the cell, there is in this, this, uh, there is this uh, decision-making uh, process. And uh, either the cell decides, I mean, the, either the final uh, fade particles decide to uh, blow up the cell and uh, the lyse the cell and, uh, uh, and being released or not. So there is a, there's a switch there, okay? So, and this engineer is basically made uh, the, the, uh, the, the circuit diagram for this decision-making process, okay? So, and this, you see that these are all the switches are basically, these are the, some, some enzymes uh, and some proteins, and there are some uh, other logic gate uh, related recombinase proteins, et cetera. You see that this, uh, this, is, this just looks really nice and it, an engineer can easily understand what's going on within a cell. 
So this approach basically helped the people to move forward. And this is basically an uh, engineer's view in biology this time. So uh, you know that there's a lot of engineering people are talking about tissue engineering, protein engineering, genetic engineering. Actually, none of them are using the word engineering in its real meaning, actually. So because engineering is about standardization, uh, about modularity, uh, about abstraction. So uh, that's why uh, this new view in synthetic biology uh, is trying to understand the cells and re-engineer them using the available tools of electrical engineering. So, and, and computer engineering. So, uh, with this uh, approach, uh, we uh, also, uh, I mean, in, in our laboratory, we are trying to develop different machines and cellular uh, machines uh, for sensing, for, uh, for uh, drug delivery tools, or for uh, as sensors. So, uh, this, these are some of the uh, topics we are interested in. Uh, and, I, uh, and one of the hot topics here we are really interested in is trying to make probiotics which can be used uh, as therapeutic in metabolic diseases. I will just mention a little bit about that. I mean, I will talk about uh, how, we are, how we are making the delivery machine, but I will mostly uh, be talking about the basic mechanism of that. Uh, so, um, so when you go into a farm store, uh, so you will see that there are people are selling uh, tons of different probiotics and all those probiotics are isolated from there, uh, from, from some, from, some, uh, some sources and they are being identified and uh, produced and then they are being packaged. So, and, they, and uh, the only thing we know about them is they are they're making some molecules for us if you take those probiotics and they are going, uh, and the hypothesis tell us, uh, so it may help your health, okay? And there, uh, as, uh, <clears throat> as of today, we don't have really solid data how these probiotics are really helping us, okay? If uh, there's uh, there some other issues going on, uh, more like this uh, about commercialization of this bacteria, or there's, there's some real, some health benefits. That's another question, but if you're interested, why don't we engineer some known probiotics, which are already living in our guts, and we use them to secrete some molecules or to sense some molecules? So that's the that's one of the our uh, our folks uh, uh, our research folks. So um, and with this uh, with this idea in mind, when I started back in my laboratory, one of the uh, one of the initial things I, I was trying to achieve is to make a bacterium that can secrete some known uh, and uh, and important uh, therapeutic pr uh, protein drugs. So uh, with this. With this, uh, we start all this engineering, etc. cetera, but uh, it doesn't take, I mean, uh, things are not moving uh, really fast uh, in the country, especially if you don't, I mean, there isn't any, uh, and there are not many people who are working in, in, in my field uh, still today. So, uh, and uh, it took us, uh, us some more time uh, to achieve this, but in the meantime, uh, this paper uh, come, uh, is, is, uh, is published uh, in 2018. So um, this paper was basically telling about a bacterium. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a specific pro probiotic that is capable of uh, synthesizing some uh, enzymes, uh, which are not, um, not, I mean, those enzymes are basically uh, used to metabolize phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is the, is, the, is the main reason why uh, the accumulation of phenylalanine is the main reason in some people, uh, those are suffering from phenylketonuria. So, and uh, the only way to treat these people is either you ha they have to be really uh, picky about their diet or they have to get in, uh, some uh, enzyme replacement therapy. So, which means that this ends, uh, this, um, uh, and, uh, this uh, PAL enzyme uh, is, uh, is mutated or the, the amount of this enzyme is not enough in those individuals. So that's why when you put this back, give this bacteria, this bacteria will go into the gut because it's already living in the gut. And, but this time it's engineered. It's uh, different than the ones which are already in, uh, uh, are living in our gut. So it will go there and it's still, it will still, it will, will uh, colonize there and uh, start to produce these enzymes uh, all the time. So, and if you're not secreted, uh, and people also put some pumps, these pumps will actually, it's not a pump, it's a vacuum pump. So this time they will suck in the, the accumulated uh, phenylalanine and they will metabolize. So the, uh, although the individuals are suffering uh, from this, uh, I mean, they don't have enough or they don't uh, have uh, the functional version of the enzyme, 
they will already have this probiotic, this active probiotics. So they will uh, live, uh, I mean, without, uh, without suffering from this disease condition. So uh, this is a uh, revolution. Uh, the first revolution the, in, in terms of the biotech was the uh, recombinant production and uh, commercial production of the uh, recombinant uh, insulin back in 1984. So I think that now that this is also another new paradigm change uh, in the in the in the in the both in drug delivery and both in biotech drugs. So uh, uh, this was. Just then, uh, I tried. To, uh, I tried to keep it uh, short, but it's never short. I, I cannot make it short uh, most of the time. But yeah, this was the idea. This was the short story that how people are starting to do a lot of research in uh, living drugs. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, our idea was a little bit different than the ones uh, that is being uh, pursued by the previous paper. <coughs> so our idea was not to suck in the, the available metabolite. Instead, we want to secrete something out. So that's why we needed to make a cell that can sense the signal. Then it can decide, OK, there was this uh, signal, this input. Now I have to secrete this protein 1, and then I have to turn it off, then secrete, start to secrete the protein 2. So uh, because there's, uh, uh, if, you, if you can uh, engineer the cells uh, and control uh, the, their, uh, their secretion pathways, so you can just have, you can come up with many different ideas and applications. You can create some living vaccines, I mean, real living vaccines, not, not uh, so, and those can be used on site for, for, for armed personnel, or you can use them for bioremediation, or you can make uh, some, uh, so, uh, you can use them to create some, uh, some uh, biofuels, or you can even use them to make biomaterials. So uh, in this talk, I will, we will most talking about how we use them uh, as uh, as uh, to synthesize intelligent targeted biologics, uh, biologic drug delivery uh, systems. So, uh, uh, but there are of, of course there are uh, many problems and many unknowns here. So one of the reasons why there are so many unknowns is uh, most of the people who are interested in microbes, in uh, especially in bacteria. Uh, they found many things. I mean, when you go to the archives of the American Society for Microbiology, there are great papers telling about this really interesting, really amazing tools of bacteria they can use. You see, uh, these are all different secretion systems. When you go, when you just check the type one secretion system, it has a, like your, if you want to secrete this protein, which is in purple, you, if you put a tag, it's being just, uh, it can uh, be uh, recognized by this, um, uh, by, uh, uh, by this pore and it can be delivered specifically. Uh, or this is another uh, great uh, tool that is being evolved in, in this bacteria that's called salmonella tifimurum. So this is, it's, a, it's called an injector zone. Basically this bacterium is using this injector zone, this injector to inject the host, okay? To secrete its uh, toxic molecules, okay? So, uh, so it can be also, this is being also, uh, this, is, uh, this is a specially, uh, a special tool that is, uh, this is basically uh, used by salmonella, but uh, people also reconstituted, managed to reconstitute it in, in E. coli as well. But the problem is those E. coli cells were not alive for a long time because the, uh, you see that each piece is made up of some protein chain. So which means that one, two, three, six uh, different, uh, pro seven different proteins should be uh, synthesized by this particular cell. And all the cell, uh, all this, uh, all this, uh, they should be also assembled on the on the on the membrane. So it's a lot of task. So uh, or you can use uh, the membrane solubilizing pro protein so that you can solubilize the membrane and you, so you express the protein. Then uh, using some uh, without any tags, non specific, you can uh, deliver them. Or you can use some fusion. This is uh, called. Uh, the uh, Sakyak translocon. So uh, this is basically, this is ba ba again, some uh, fusion partners you need to use. And these fusion partners are basically helping these proteins to be released. Or there's another uh, recently new uh, way of uh, protein secretion from bacteria. Those are called transport, autotransporters. And uh, these are uh, here, uh, it's a little bit more, um, uh, less challenging compared to other systems. Uh, to secrete some protein. So uh, we, we, we sat, I sat down and just read most of the literature about this and I come up with ideas using this. Uh, I will show you why I chose this one. 
So this is basically, I know this is a lot of biochemistry here, but uh, so this is how it's working. This is the original, uh, pull, uh, uh, the original uh, chain of the uh, chain of the pack, the, the original pull pack of chain of this protein. So uh, we, uh, as, as uh, I mean, you may remember, I mentioned that you want to make a system where we, where the cell can decide to release some protein. So to release a protein, uh, there we need two things, right? We have to need a, we, we need a shuttle that should move the protein to the cell surface. The second protein should be a, a, a, another one that that should uh, cut the, the, the, the, the carbo protein from the cell surface. So how do you cut the protein? You use proteases. So uh, how, uh, and you want to make it more, uh, you want to make it really, uh, really a, a specific uh, uh, Excision. So how we can do that? We need to use some specific proteases with some specific recognition sites. So uh, let's see how we how we achieve that. So uh, there is this beta translocation domain, as you see, that's basically folded in a in a in a, in a barrel-like structure, and basically it's uh, it's located uh, in the ex, uh, in the in the membrane. So then there is this this other part, right, in the original one. This is basically the the one that's called alpha passenger domain. Alpha passenger domain is basically cut from an by a pathways from here, and it's basically uh, folded in another uh, this, this this helical structure, and this helical structure basically sits on to the barrel structure through some electrostatic interaction. There is no covalent bonding, and through the electrostatic interaction, it sits on the barrel structure. And uh, believe me, uh, this this uh, I'm sorry, uh, some some pigeons are hitting on my window, so making some noise. Sorry about that. So. Um, uh, yeah, this, this structure is sitting on the barrel structure. And the interesting thing is when you check them under the electron microscope, you will see that this bacteria are using this L-shaped structures to make some Velcro-like structures. So they are it's like just holding their fingers or hands each other. And so that this is one of the things that they, uh, one of the proteins they are using during the biofilm formation. So uh, what's happening here is, I mean, wh what we did is we basically removed this part, okay? Uh, and this part, this, this part here, and we added the carbo protein. So in uh, in our uh, studies, we used uh, fluorescent proteins to track what's going to e to be able to easily track what's going on here. So then we put a recognition site for the proteins that we are going to use for specific cutting. Okay. Then we have the rest of the our passenger domain. So what we have here is we have the signal peptide. We use another signal peptide here. So this is what we achieved. So we we, we cloned it. We put it in the cell. Uh, and then we run the whole system. So now what's happening is your, our expectation was, okay, if you have this protein expressed nicely and uh, at the end of this cargo protein, we also added a tag, which is not shown here. This tag is uh, it's called an his tag. So you can label it with some other uh, molecules or particles here. We, uh, we uh, express the protein on the surface. So then we label it with gold nanoparticles uh, uh, with some spe special uh, coating. So it can nicely bind on the cis tag. So this shows this all dots are basically uh, particles, uh, uh, five nanometer gold nanoparticles attached on this, on this protein. So we labeled it. So we checked them uh, for elemental analysis and it seems like there's gold, which, which, which tells us Plus, okay, we have gold on the surface, and this is in the mock one, so we didn't observe anything here. So, and we also ran another test. It's an immunocytochemistry test. You see that we we are expressing GFP on the surface because it is the cargo protein. It's on the surface now. This is the, uh, uh, and we do a secondary uh, tagging with another antibody. So you see that, it, and this is now it's it's red now. So you see that there is a nice foundation that we have this protein on the surface. So. Uh, there is this, uh, so uh, the, uh, now we want to uh, check, test actually, we, if we can really specifically uh, remove uh, the, the cargo protein from the surface. So that's why we added this, this, this specific protease that's called T protease. And T protease basically finds the specific recognition site here and it basically shapes whatever you have on the surface. If you shave those molecules on those, uh, those proteins from the surface, which are uh, fluorescing in green, you should be seeing an increasing supernatural fluorescence while you should be observing a decrease in the whole cell fluorescence. So which basically validates that we have, we can uh, this externally added type protein can cut what we have on the surface. But the thing here was, um, it's good. Um, 
we can we add it. Okay, we, we bought it from a company. The state property is later on we also made. I mean, we are still we are also making it in the laboratory. But uh, so we, you add it externally. The cell is not making in state properties. So it seems like the uh, I mean, it's it's a nice proof of concept. So then what? So remember that we want to make an autonomous system, which means that we should the cells should gather the signal, secrete everything, and at the end of the day, we should be seeing only the, the release protein. So for that purpose, we also call this plate another protein. So that is a tail protease. Now, instead of adding externally, the cell decides when to produce the, produce the uh, scissors, okay? The scissors are produced, expressed, then uh, this is a, a wrong, uh, I mean, it's not, the, the correct uh, display of how how uh, they are originally uh, located. So uh, next to each next to each uh, cargo protein here, there's the tail protein. Tail protein goes and cuts it from here and release. So uh, releases the cargo protein. So let's uh, and what we, what should we observe here is basically if we have both of the signals, which means that the signal tells us only we should have. Uh, both of the uh, input on, which this is a simple end gate. You uh, this is this should be only the case where we are seeing the release of the cargo protein, which is happening here. And we can also tune the amount of the release protein. So by just changing some uh, the the input signals. So this is good. So we managed to show it's working nicely. So, but the the the the the, uh, the, the challenge here was: can we do it? Uh, that can we do a sequential proteins? Uh, protein squishing. So, um, uh, by the way, how much, I, how much time do I have left? You have half, a, half an hour. Oh, okay. Uh, 30 minutes. Okay, 30 more minutes. Yes. Okay, so uh, what is happening here, we want a state machine. Okay, state machine is basically uh, a, a device, okay? Uh, there, uh, this is basically, uh, uh, the the vending machines, right? You you put a, a coin in it, and it's uh, it basically uh, processes the, the signal and it creates an output. So and uh, when the output is back, so it's it's back in position one. So you have three positions. So we also use the state machine. We, we try to make a state machine just using uh, for for sequential protein release. So what's happening here is basically uh, we want to secrete protein one, then turn it off. Then we want to secrete protein two. Then we turn it back to the original state. So how how should we how can we achieve this? So we built these two circuits. So uh, and for this purpose we use some spe some specific enzymes. These enzymes are called recombinase. A recombinase enzyme is an uh, it basically recognizes a piece uh, some some some specific DNA regions. Okay, on the on the whole DNA part, some regions those are recognition sites. And it basically it either flips or excites the DNA between its recognition sites. Okay, so uh, we use two uh, two enzymes, recombinase enzymes, BXP1 or TP901, so to flip uh, the DNA uh, pieces uh, between its recognition sites. So uh, as you see here, we have this this promoter. Okay, it's the initiation of the transcription. So but we have a terminator here, which means that at the end of the day, we will not able to get a translation if you have a terminator like this on your transcript. So that, that's why uh, uh, that uh, we have to flip this, okay? So un unless we flip it, we cannot see any signal here. How this will be happening? So we turn on, uh, we turn on TP901. So remember that we want to flip the, uh, we want to express this protein, and we we have to we also want we also want to express the the proteins the Caesar protein the Caesar protein should go and cut this one okay so what we did here is uh, we just turn on the uh, turn on the BXP1 we basically start to express BXP1 we in, we uh, feed another signal okay the signal is in BXP1 is expressed it for I mean it's not first or second because it's an enzyme it uh, goes and tries to find its its uh, recognition site it binds here and binds here it flips them so uh, the signal is in it flips now because it flipped now this is uh, there is no blocking so there's translation so and there's no blocking here you see that this, this promoter doesn't have a meaning here okay unless it's flipped. So it's flipped now, it's turned, it's, it's now it's an initiation site for the expression of the state proteins. 
So it's flipped here and there, and just the protein is on, so it's released from the surface. So the, the second question is how, how we revert this and express the second protein. So we feed in another signal. So uh, this, this another signal is basically, uh, uh, is basically uh, chain, uh, should initiate the expression of the, sec uh, uh, the, the second protein. So how this is happening is, uh, is easy to understand, I believe. So now we are turning on this guy. Okay, TP901. So the, the signal number two is in. This is express. It goes and finds its recognition site here. You see that it flipped now this, uh, this uh, promoter. So the switch is off actually for this one, but switch is on for this one. So, and it showed that. So there was an, uh, we managed to, uh, we managed to express, uh, I mean, turn uh, off the expression of the protein number one and turn on the protein number two. So this can be applied for different drug systems and this can be combined with some sensors and this can be used as an, uh, for example, one of the challenges we are trying, I mean, one of the projects we are trying to complete nowadays and uh, which is also, uh, we, we made the patent application for it and waiting for it as well. So is that we want to build a system where we can detect glucose and some other uh, input molecules levels uh, from gut and to start to secrete some insulin, uh, not insulin actually, some other anti-diabetic drugs actually, uh, actually. So, and try to control a feedback mechanism. We make a feedback, we'll make a, we made a feedback mechanism and we can, that can help us to secrete these anti-diabetic drugs. So we managed to show that it is nicely released uh, using some uh, some labeling techniques and using those mass spectroscopy. This is a drug that we are interested in. It's nicely uh, expressed. So in the experiments are ongoing and still, uh, as I said, it's not complete in that part, but we are very excited about this. So there are also many other metabolic diseases we are working on. This can this approach uh, can be also used and applied for many different, uh, for many different, uh, uh, Ray diseases because there are many many ray diseases which are uh, which are uh, which are related with uh, with metabolism, and this can this approach can be extended uh, for that purpose. Okay, uh, so uh, we I, I also I also want to show this. This is a uh, this is another application of this the same approach. This time we want also secrete. Uh, the idea was just uh, let's make a uh, bacterium that can go and find the tumor cells stick on them and secrete some toxin to kill them. So uh, we built the circuit here. Uh, I'm not going to do too much in detail here, but the idea is simple. So we have uh, this, this, uh, this, tox this is the toxin molecule and this is the molecule that basically, this is a nanobody that is expressed on the surface. And this, this nanobody is specific to HER2 receptors. HER2 receptors are overexpressed in the case of the breast cancers. So this bacteria, we, what we, because this is a model study, of course, we want to you apply it in colon cancer and some other cancers, not breast cancer, but breast cancer was one of the easiest one to start with for, for us as a model. So it's, uh, it can, and it can also be used in breast cancer, but we need some more, some, some other um, domestication of this bacteria. So it can go and stick on the surface and start to release then we, with, the, with the second signal, we can start turn on the, the toxin squishing. So, and we managed to show it. So this is the, the, the green ones are uh, the, the HER2, uh, uh, so, so GIM, GIM, GIM T1 cells. And this, the green ones are basically green fluorescent protein expressed uh, in the cells. And what we have is the, the red ones are basically our E. coli, the, the probiotic bacterium. And it can, they can stick on this tumor cells and then they can secrete the toxin and kill the cells. So uh, this was the very early data of what we, when we started this. So we, we, uh, we improved this a lot. So now carrying out some microfolic experiments as well. So we'll be moving on to animal experiments very soon. So um, another approach uh, where we can use synthetic biology is making sensors. So uh, today, I mean, uh, we have like, there are many different types of sensors and people are, uh, and all of the sensors can be used to detect many different uh, traits or, uh, or uh, different biomarkers. But one of the challenges uh, here is why don't we make a sensor so uh, using the cells, uh, because if you can make a cell using a cell, so you can, 
uh, amplify your, uh, your, your uh, you, can, you can find the ways to, uh, for the amplification of your sen uh, sensor signal at, uh, plus, you can grow your sensor. So, and you can just add some sugar and nitrogen resource and that's it. So you have like many sensors uh, alive. So uh, what we, uh, how we did start this project is, uh, it was my first year and uh, I was thinking to you to, to, uh, to start a, a drug uh, toxicity screening uh, system, but uh, because of some funding issues, I switched uh, to nanomaterial uh, toxicity, uh, toxicity monitoring. So that's why, because uh, there, there is a there is a basis for this as well. Nanomaterials are everywhere. So nanomaterials are in your uh, in your in I mean in, in baby food formulas. Nano, nano, nanomaterials are in your in in the uh, in the drug uh, uh, formulations you are using. I mean one of the uh, examples is the the the the the, uh, the mRNA vaccine or uh, vaccines, right? They are all being uh, encapsulated in uh, lipid nanoparticles, for example. So they are basically everywhere. I mean, they are they are uh, highly used, and they uh, and they are they are in our uh, just just in the middle of our life. So in, in many different cosmetics, you are getting you are using they are using tons of uh, nanomaterials. So uh, what about the toxicity? So the idea was, uh, if you want to uh, if you want to monitor the toxicity. Uh, of uh, some particular uh, nanomaterial, you have to use animals. So, the, and you have to uh, mo you have to monitor the toxicity level and effective uh, effect of the toxicity for a long time. So instead, we we came up with this idea: why don't you why don't we make a system? And uh, in the system, we just uh, just put uh, the uh, mix the particle with the sensor, and the sensor tell tells us if the particle is toxic or not. So using this very, very rough uh, idea, we can re-engineer the particle to decrease its uh, level of toxicity. So with this purpose, with this uh, idea, uh, we were talking that is there any toxicity and what is the toxicity uh, reporting mechanism in uh, in nature? So when you are if you are interested in this in this mechanism, one of the uh, answers is going to be the, like. Are you talking about genotoxicity or you are talking about protein toxicity? So we are basically interested in, uh, in, in, in protein toxicity, uh, which, is the heat, which is controlled by heat shock response uh, system. And in the heat shock response system, uh, there are some specific proteins, our their expressions controlled by specific promoters. And there, if there isn't some chemical toxicity, this, those promoters are turned on, uh, those expression of these proteins are uh, on and they go and help the proteins not to be uh, unfolded. So, uh, and those are called chaperones, uh, the specific proteins. So we, uh, we uh, just uh, extract from the literature and we check all this promoter and found that none of this promoter, even you are using them with heat, with temperature, sorry, uh, like high, at high temperatures, this should overexpress. So, and the idea was this. So we, we got a promoter that is, uh, that is, uh, that, uh, is a part of the heat shock response system. Then downstream of the promoter, we have a, a, a reporter uh, protein. So when there is a, uh, when there is stress condition, so it's a chemical stress is coming in. The promoter will uh, be also uh, help because it will be on, and because the sigma factors will be released, and they uh, and we should expect uh, the, our reporter is also being expressed, uh, and we will uh, see that okay, there is an, there is an expression of this protein, so there is a toxicity here. So, but it didn't work out very well for our case. The reason is why it didn't work very well is uh, very simple, because all of the sensors are uh, uh, basically uh, all of the sensors are uh, leaky. Leaky means that they are uh, they are showing a lot of function without uh, the without uh, feeding a, a signal. So, uh, and it makes sense uh, because I mean these are just the guards of the cells. So, and you want them expressed all the time. So that's why using their uh, their promoters is not the best idea. So that's why we use some, we added some S special synthetic locks. Okay, we, we lock them using this, uh, using this uh, system that's called driver regulator system. And you see that when the signals, uh, this is the, uh, this is uh, no toxicity case, this is toxicity case. Uh, we turned off the background signal just like this. And, but the problem was again when we want to turn it off in the in the purple case, this is the toxicity case. It didn't work out very well, okay? Uh, except this specific uh, promoter. So uh, and we start to talk about okay, there is a problem here, and we want I mean the problem. Uh, 
what's the basic uh, the basis of this problem is the answer is simple so um actually uh, uh because all the systems are working in activation based uh activation based um transcription so the instead of activation we want to uh, i mean it would be really great if we were thinking about that uh, if we come up with some uh, some transcription that is more repression based so why don't we uh, i mean we checked the whole literature and we, found, we came up with this bacterium that is the mycobacterium tuberculosis and the mycobacterium tuberculosis basically uh, doing what is uh, it's, it has some specific uh, proteins that protein uh, is based uh, in the in the in the in non-toxicity case, it blocks uh, the transcription here. So while it blocks the transcription, uh, so it's a suppression-based system. When there is toxicity, is, I mean, which is this, which is translated as a as a chemical stress. So it comes out, and the the the RNA polymerase is now the the the the, the, the HR, This is the blocking protein. The repressive protein is it's removed. Now we have an expression. So uh, of course we just put removed it from mycobacterium tuberculosis. In E. coli, we need to domesticate it by doing some engineering as well. It's not working. It's not copy paste. In nature, there's no copy paste. Okay, if you do a copy paste, it will work with a really, really, really low degree of uh, uh, yield. So and most of the time, you will not see a, sig a significant uh, signal increase. So and in show uh, and using this uh, diff we try different designs. Uh, we use different designs, uh, and these designs told us, uh, I mean, uh, showed us that how we can use the system. Uh, I mean, uh, and this when we there talks to you, see that uh, after uh, so there is a decrease, a uh, increase in the in the in the signal output. Uh, we, we first tested with temperature, of course. Then later on, we applied the uh, the chem uh, the toxic signal, toxic uh, the chemical toxicity. So it, it turned out that we, if once we uh, treat them with some toxic quantum dots, nanoparticles, so there's an increase in fault increase in the in the, in the signal. So uh, these are two different designs, of course. So uh, and the take home message here is the cell. I mean, they uh, the cells are while they are dying, they are and before they die, you see that we keep them, uh, we interact them for a long time. They start to die, which is expected. Uh, but they still uh, produce some signal. We, we do all the validation with uh, some uh, known uh, oxidizing agents. We check that how this is happening, uh, uh, contributing to the to the some uh, some uh, proteins and uh, protein expression levels, uh, especially uh, just <clears throat> sorry uh, reactive oxygen species blocking proteins. So and then this is the this is the uh, this is dynamic range analysis of the of the of the sensor we uh, made. So uh, I'm running out of time. That's why I will cut it short. So um, we use the same approach to detect another uh, another uh, sensor. So here we are basically uh, detecting uric acid and urea. Uh, these are two important uh, biomarkers uh, to follow up the kidney uh, some kidney diseases. So the idea was uh, to build a, a single cell. The cell will, uh, I mean, if there is no, uh, no, uh, there isn't any any of these biomarkers, there we shouldn't be seeing any signal. Why we start to see some express? These are real image of the plate, by the way. So, uh, so, and this is uh, we should we should be seeing some signal. Okay, if you, it's on the urea, it's green. While it's too, when, when the uric acid is coming in, it becomes orange. While uh, we have, if we have both of them uh, at a certain level, we should be seeing the cells to fluoresce uh, yellow. So, uh, and we also apply to this, this is an in vitro uh, sensing. So we we apply this, uh, so we build a switch by uh, uh, uh, RNA based switch uh, sensor. So uh, to sense the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus as well, and what we what we have here is basically uh, we, we we designed this RNA piece. Okay, so the RNA piece, this transcript basically is is contained this recognition site. Then the RBS is embedded. Then you have a start codon because RBS is embedded. There is no translation. So unless you have trigger RNA, which is which is the I mean this trigger RNA is the part from the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So it comes in and interact with the recognition site, opens up the RBS, it's not embedded them anymore, and the ribosome is recruited and the signal uh, is on. So the signal is basically the, the repressed gene, 
I mean, control, uh, uh, expressed by the repressed gene, which is this GFP in this particular case. So of, co of course, we made many designs, tons of uh, like uh, screening, filtered them, and we come up with, um, with the correct design. So this is the uh, this is um, this is basically what we are doing. Uh, don't uh, I mean, although it seems like a little bit uh, like almost four and a half hour, but yeah, this is a total and optimized uh, uh, the initial uh, design. So, uh, and what we are doing, we are first uh, uh, amplifying uh, some parts from the viral genome and then we use them uh, in the uh, in vitro transcription translation uh, reaction and we, we produce the signal. So we used uh, more than 60 different uh, patients, clinical patient samples and we check, uh, we compared it with, with the PCR as well. So when, the, uh, when we have a, like uh, around, uh, this is like 26, 28, uh, so uh, after that the viral load towards like if the viral load becomes less uh, so we cannot uh, our, uh, the sense to is not that good but still it can be used for household uh, applications so and still this is in the in the process of commercialization it took a lot of time commercialized things in Turkey un unfortunately but yeah we are in the process of commercialization of this so uh, and it's uh, the paper is uh, the patent is just uh, sent out and the paper is uh, almost published so can we also use this uh, architecture to uh, create uh, materials, uh, this, all this idea? So the answer uh, is yes. Uh, so uh, we can create different logic gates to control the patterning. Patterning means that if you have fibers, so can we make like, digi can we digitize it? So which means 1010 or something like that. So, or 110, <clears throat> things like that. So uh, for this purpose, we basically, uh, use this logic case, we build up this logic gate. So you see that, uh, so if, if it's an uh, OR gate in the OR gate, the truth table tells you, you should be seeing uh, signal all the time, either uh, one, of, at least one of the signals are, uh, are present. So, and it seems like that it's only one signal, only the other signal. And you see that the output is the, is the, is the material, this is biofilm protein. Okay. You have only to see this only signal one, only signal two. If you have both of them, you see that it's more stronger. So, and same here, if you have an end gate, you should be only seeing the signal in the presence of both of the input signals. You see that there is no signal, uh, the, the, there, is, there is signal uh, here, but there is no output. But if you have both of them, it's on. So, and then we uh, just, what we can do is we basically uh, pattern the structures and we labeled them. We just, uh, how did we digitize the system is basically we use uh, protein, uh, CSGA protein, uh, which is labeled and unlabeled, uh, which is tag or untag. The tag one should be, can be labeled later on. And we, you see that all those black dots are here uh, basically labeled. You see that the density here and here are totally different because of the patterning. Uh, that's the, those are being controlled uh, by the, are being controlled the imply gate uh, we made uh, here so uh, the the final part of my talk is going to be about uh, can we make a cell where we are uh, uh, and we can we can basically tell the cell okay you have this ion okay and just use this ion and synthesize some nanomaterial to us uh, and the idea is uh, feed in many signals and the cell should decide, okay, I, there are like this iron one, iron two, iron number three. So I have like gold iron, I have silver iron, I have copper iron, I have, um, I don't know, just platinum iron. So, uh, and then uh, if, if there's gold iron, okay, there is this, this the scaffold, uh, which is here and I'm turning on the production of the scaffold. Scaffold is here, and now here are the gold nano particles. That's what was our expectation. That's why we use the CSJ protein, that's the major uh, biofilm protein. Biofilms are basically extracellular matrices of the bacteria, and they can be used as, uh, as, as a scaffolding of the nucleation of different nanoparticles. And for, to increase the rate of nucleation, we added some uh, material binding uh, peptides and uh, uh, uh, we fused them. So uh, for this particular case, first, the idea is, okay, the, the first module, okay, this module one, is the, uh, can we just, produce the cell can produce the protein, the, the scaffold, and we grow some materials on that. Can we do this? The answer is yes. We tried it with different, this is induced and uninduced, so no iron, yes, uh, uh, iron is in. 
uh, I mean, you can, you can follow up for me. It's a, a CM, the scanning electron microscopy, transmission electron microscopy, validation of this. And we also do element, we did some elemental analysis here, okay? So, and after this, this module was, first module was done. The second module should be a sensor, okay? The sensor should sense, okay, there's this ion outside of my cell, outside of the membrane, so I'm taking it in. When this ion is in, so I should, uh, the cell should sense it, right? If it, uh, we, and we focused on three different, a cadmium, gold, or iron, okay? So it's a, it's, a, it's a semiconductor, a metal, and a metal oxide uh, compounds, uh, initiators. So uh, the, we check the signal, uh, the, the sensor sensors are working really fine. We check the cross reactivity, except the iron. Uh, the other two seems really fine, but we, it still works in the, in the case of iron, but not that good compared to other ones. So, uh, and this is, the, this is my uh, final uh, image. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a representative image from this uh, paper. So uh, the idea is uh, we have this cadmium selenite nano, uh, quantum dot nanoparticle synthesizing device. So uh, what we have here, so we have the sensor part, we have the second module, okay? This is the, sorry, <clears throat> this, is the first, uh, this is the first module. This is the second module. The first module is the, uh, material synthesizing part. The second module is basically the sensing part. This basically decides either the, the cadmium selenite synthesizing uh, scaffold should be secreted or not. So, when, and we put, because the CAD R, this is basically a transcription factor. It, it, is, it activates the promoter when it, only if it binds to cadmium. So, uh, but the problem is this is another leaky system because we got this, remember? Yeah, we got this Kadar from this organism, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and we are trying to reconstitute in E. coli. So one thing that we should keep always in mind, as I said, just there is no copy and paste in nature, okay? You have to re-engineer everything. So that's why when you put this E. coli in, in E. coli, because, uh, because, uh, because what you are putting is not the protein, but the gene, right? And the gene has uh, other linkers. And, you, if you, and sometimes you don't have a good idea of how linkers are functioning. That's why there can be some background signal here. That's why what we need to do is we have to turn off the background signal, how we used a, a, a riboregulator that I showed you previously, okay? So when this is the cadmium is in, this is synthesized, the cadmium, uh, cad R, transcription factor is synthesized. It binds to cadmium ion creates a complex, it turns on, uh, it starts uh, and it recreates here on a polymerase. And uh, uh, so um, <coughs> uh, uh, it, it turns on the expression of the CSGA uh, material binding uh, domain. Uh, so, and it's synthesized, you see that we check that uh, if, the, if the Pentagon signal here, if the particles are not, uh, the, the, the, the scaffold is nice, Synthesizer, it's not synthesized here. On the TM, you see that there's some nucleation of the material. We checked it with the electron elemental analysis. There's cadmium here, and we also do, did the function analysis. You see that one of the important properties of the uh, nano, uh, uh, no, quantum dot nanoparticles is they fluoresce, right? So, and our cells are, are also expressing, it's not shown here, GFP. So, this is the background, uh, uh, sorry, RFP, not GFP, sorry. So this is the background signal that comes directly from the this uh, this fibers and the all the particles on the fibers. Okay, so grown particles. So we have the cells. The cells are basically expressing red fluorescent protein. When we overlay this too, you see that these these are all green dots, right? Uh, I mean, these are really it's a micro dot. So um, these are not uh, nano sized now, but I mean they are basically aggregated here. So but we can still observe them under the uh, confocal uh, microscope. So with this, I'm done. Uh, so this is uh, this is our uh, most of our group. So uh, some have left. Uh, now uh, it's not. Yeah, it's it's going bad. I I remember this. And she's a she's a postdoc. Uh, she's a postdoc in Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Uh, and Ebru is just uh, graduated uh, and working in our uh, in a in a company biotech company here. And yeah, and these are all our founders. Uh, and thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm sorry I took a little bit long, longer than I uh, planned. Thank no, you. thank you very much. This was great. Uh, uh, right on time, we finished it. That we have uh, 
we we will have to if you just uh, stop sharing we will uh, see everybody and i'll take some uh, pictures over everybody uh, that we have to do and nowadays uh, for people if there are any questions uh, while people are gathering up uh, please raise your hand or just uh, uh, write it on the chat that you have a question and i'll bring it to the attention of the presenter Uh, let me see. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, we will start with quick questions, then turn off the streaming at one point, and then go to more uh, softbed style questions. I guess if, if there are any, uh, you you still have some time, right, Rartoja? Yeah, yeah, I oh, excellent. So, uh, expecting questions still. From the audience, people are gathering their talks. Let's uh, kick off by saying, uh, so, uh, so there is, there is, so this, let's say, engineered cells. So uh, you're actually, mm, you can utilize many different types of cells, right? Not necessarily. Yeah. You, you, there is there a favorite one for a particular reason? So or one of the reasons, one of the things is uh, we we we uh, we are most focused on using some probiotics. So uh, um, the, the, the reason is actually uh, because uh, these are being, uh, these are already uh, available in your body. I mean, you, they, it's, they are living in your body. So, and so most of them are isolated and we know. And um, and the good thing is about them is uh, we can also do some, uh, some, some um, sequencing uh, and we, uh, a metagenomic analysis from your gut uh, microorganisms. And you can also come up with some uh, like precision medicine type of a personalized medicine type of application as well, because we already have all this tool and we can just, we can put it in your, in your very own cells and we can send them back to your uh, gut. So, and um, so there isn't any popular one. I mean, there are some popular ones like E. coli Nissel 1917. Okay. Uh, e. coli Nissel 1917 is a, is a specific, I mean, We know that E. coli has many different uh, strains. Some of them are really toxic and pathogenic, actually, uh, and causing a lot of deaths, especially in the United States from, from sipinage, you know, right? Uh, it's it's, it's a, uh, one of the cases uh, reported every, almost every year in the U.S., especially. So, uh, and this one, this E. coli Nissel 1917, is a specific strain that's been isolated from a soldier back in the first world, a German uh, soldier in First World War. So, and now it's, uh, we, we bought it from a pharmacy store in Germany, actually, the, the unengineered one. So, and there is uh, another yeast that's also popular, uh, that's called Saccharomyces boiondi. So, uh, the, uh, if I'm not wrong, they are selling it uh, as, as Mufflor or Reflor, I can remember that, uh, that being prescribed, especially for the kids when they have diarrhea. So, uh, uh, And um, these are the ones that we are most using, but um, we are also engineering some like many mammalian cells as well. Uh, as I said, uh, it took a lot of time for us to engineer all, the, all of them and make them to function. So, uh, uh, and like, especially uh, mesenchymal stem cells, uh, those are also a good source, can be a good source for engineering, I mean, a good tool for engineering because you can, I mean, you know that they, uh, nowadays like many uh, peoples are getting injected with them and we can make, we can engineer them to screen some drug molecules as well. So that's also one of the things on the table uh, in our lab. So uh, yeah, there is any specific one, but most of the probiotic, as I said, because they are safer and we know that they are safe and they're uh, from our body. So that's why we have started with those. Interesting. Okay, uh, I still, uh... If I am not, I'm host, probably I can see if there are, if I'm not missing any raised hands, please let me know. Let me continue on that front. So that means, uh, you, so, so the idea would be then, instead of delivering drugs each time the, a person needs, you mm -hmm. essentially deliver cells, which, not deliver cells, but you, you put the cells yeah. cross proximity with the body, It, uh, in the in the microbiota or something that will continuously synthesize that drug molecule whenever they need it. So it's essentially almost one time application, right? It's, it's, it's yes. that's the, uh, the main yeah, idea. Yeah. Instead of like yeah, yeah. giving the drug, why don't you synthesize the drug with the bacteria inside? And you can just edit that genetic component within that cells. 
and that's uh, that's easier said than done. But I guess that's the ba basic idea. Is that's going to be a total cure? Yes, that is totally the idea. So just it seems like it's it uses the same idea with the CAR T cells. So CAR T cells are also engineered, and it's all like you can do. You can also personalize them as well. So uh, it's the same idea actually. You, you re-engineer some cells and you give them back to the body. So uh, as you said, uh, so we the idea is not to when you uh, administer, uh, I mean, the administration of many different drug molecules, including many antibodies, especially for cancer, right? So uh, not especially for cancer, especially for cancer, but uh, mostly for cancer, let's say. So uh, these are really expensive drug molecules. And if you can find a way to uh, use some cells to secrete them when they're in the body, so uh, it will be uh, much, I mean, it, you, the other good thing is we can also use them as targeted uh, tools. Okay, we can target, use them for targeting because what you need to do is for targeting is very similar to what people are doing for with, with polymeric uh, drug uh, delivery tools. So you add some recogn recognition molecules around them and then you can basically uh, create, uh, you can uh, engineer them in such a way that they can track some signals, okay? For example, there's one study that's uh, an ongoing study in the laboratory. We are trying to uh, use some hypoxia related promoters so that they can track the hypoxia, okay? The, if, the, if the level of oxygen uh, is going down, the, uh, we, we can also connect the, the sensor with the, the move with the, the motion of the flagellum so it can move faster, okay? And it can penetrate uh, into the tumor. So what things are, I mean, when you, these, are, it's, it, these are some possible things that we can do, but it takes a lot of time to engineer because one of the problems here is uh, although there is a lot of tools available in the nature, it takes a lot of time to domesticate them, okay? We got them from some other bacterium and we have to make it sure they're not toxic and toxic to the bacteria itself or toxic to the specific uh, mammalian cells. Uh, so we, uh, this is uh, one of the issues. So as you said, we are, instead of uh, making the people take drugs every day, just let them eat some yogurt, okay? So, or drink some... I don't know, some, some, some other products. So, and let them uh, have this bacteria going in directly into their gut. And the good thing is when they start to colonize them, okay? They are not staying there for forever. They should be swept, uh, I mean, they're by, the, by the immune system and for, by, uh, by the body actually. So every 15 days or something like that. So for the study I showed you for phenylketonuria in the first or uh, in, the, in the second slide, if I'm not wrong, or third slide, so uh, in that study, that's a phase two clinical trial, by the way. It's almost done. I mean, not almost done. The phase two clinical trial is done by the, uh, right now. So, and uh, what's happening now is uh, people trying to, uh, people trying to uh, show that this can, they, they are about to stay, start to phase two, phase three trials uh, in US. So uh, it seems like people don't need to take uh, an enzyme replacement therapy because enzyme replacement therapies, for example, they are really, really expensive because especially when you are talking about rare disease conditions, for example, and those are metabolism related rare disease conditions, you have to spend tons of money. I mean, you know it from uh, this, this SMA, for example, right? So it, uh, or some other ones, I, I can remember right now, uh, but uh, as it said, it's a rare disease. So we have to engineer, you have their, the, most of the companies don't want to make them. But if you can find a way uh, to engineer bacteria or some other organisms to cure those diseases, it will be, I, I, I assume it's gonna be uh, cheaper, uh, but there are issues, of course. I'm not, talk, uh, I'm not talking here about, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that things are really great, that no, things are not great, but now physically we show that this can work, okay? So we have to spend some more time on this uh, therapies. And I believe that this is gonna be in the clinic uh, in coming years, uh, there is, uh, for example, uh, another idea is we already know there's some some pathogenic bacteria, right? They infect okay. us, and we know that these bacteria are living. Uh, they they have the capability uh, to uh, penetrate in those body parts. So which is good because they uh, they are already doing targeting actually. What we need to do is we get this bacteria. And we, del we can delete all the pathogenesis related gene caskets. When you do that, they cannot show any pathogenesis at those parts. 
So now you can load your drug molecule and you just let the people get infected, okay, for good. Then uh, they, those bacteria can start to secrete those drug molecules, okay, to secrete, uh, to, to kill uh, their, uh, I mean, their, I mean, the, the, the original ones, etc. So there, uh, I believe that there, I mean, there, there, there's, a, there's this, uh, this really huge field and there, there are a lot of opportunities here. And uh, yeah, uh, and uh, I really, uh, I really suggest all of the people who are interested or just want to read about this, just check some uh, recent papers or nature news or science news. Uh, I mean, you will see that there are many companies now, especially in the US, uh, working on this. There's one company that's called Synologic. If you check their pipeline, you will be amazed. Uh, there are more than 10 different therapies they're working on. Most of them are uh, just passed to uh, either uh, phase two or phase two trials, phase three trials. So uh, there is a question regarding the immune reaction of this. Uh, is there any immune reaction reported when you use these genetically modified probiotics? Yeah, we, we, restricting we activity or triggering an uncontrolled inflammatory reaction. That's from uh, Dr. Fatma Vizal Okur from Hacettepe mm -hmm. University. That's a good, very good uh, question. The answer is for the ones that that is being used at the moment. Uh, there, there are some. There were some, but it wasn't uh, very. Uh, I mean, uh, it wasn't very problematic. Uh, so uh, this is these are the data that I'm talking from the phase two trials uh, for the drug that uh, I showed you. For the other ones, when you check them, uh, we are still using these model organisms. Okay, we are using the uh, rats and mice. So that's why in, in those one we didn't see. I mean not only my particular experience, but uh, the experience from other labs doesn't say that uh, there, is a, there is a real big problem at the moment. But of course, this is a concern. And there's uh, more research uh, need to be done on this one. But pe and people are doing this. Uh, uh, more than the inflammation, actually, one of the biggest problems is uh, what's going to happen if this, this immune system actually blocks the cells, okay, and kills right. the cells. So that's another uh, problem for, the, for people who are trying to develop this technology nowadays. Same idea for the adenoviral vectors for vaccines, right? What if they get uh, blocked by the immune system? I see. Uh, Rana Ajam, do you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Rartu. This was a great talk. I had to go in and out, so I might have missed a few things, but I think I might have the chance to re watch it if we have a recording. Uh, it was a group, amazing talk. It, started so many things in my mind. Uh, one is I missed the last company's name that you just mentioned. I want to take note of it and look at uh, it. It's Synlogic. Synlogic, yes. okay. And the other one is when we are talking about, again, for cancer, that you are using these as delivery vehicles, are we still talking about oral delivery or are these going to be IV? Till the last minute, I never thought of them as oral, but then yeah. with the phenylketonuria example, it just sparked so many other ideas now. Yeah, with, with phenylketonuria, you're right. One of the things is it, it, it's going to, I mean, they're they administrating it. It's uh, actually, uh, uh, there's, this, this, the, uh, there's this really old example uh, for, for the treatment of sarcomas back in the uh, 1850s or something like that. There was this guy. Um, I forgot his name, so uh, what a shame. So he actually, he was, uh, tr he was isolating some pathogenic bacteria. He was injecting them directly into the sarcomas. So, and trying to treat them. There's also one approach here, people where people want to direct injection directly into, into, in, uh, direct into the tumors. So that's one thing. Uh, and for IVs, yes, for, especially for cancer, and when we're talking about cancer, for uh, IV is one of the things people are uh, planning to do. Uh, and they have also done, but you may come up with the question, what about the septic shock? So <laughs> that's another issue. So that's why, for example, for the, for the E. coli missile 1917, that it has an a specific uh, LPS layer. That, that does, doesn't septic shock, it's being uh, uh, injected into your vein. So uh, there, isn't any, uh, there isn't very, very clear picture of it at the moment. But yeah, these are the, some of the, uh, especially for, for the cancer one, they just started the, the, the phase one trials uh, by that company I mentioned, and there are other some companies, some two other companies, uh, but yeah, uh, both IV and oral. 
Great, thank you. Sure, thank you very much for your kind words as well, Rana Hocam.